gives me great pleasure to introduce on behalf of, of the St. Michael's Lectures, Professor Adrian Thatcher, who is Professor of Br Applied Theology at the University of Exeter. Adrian is very well known for his work in the field of sexuality, so we're very pleased to have him here with us talking about a subject which not only is, is topical but affects the lives and faith of people both inside the church and outside the church. Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for um, turning out tonight, and thank you to St. Michael's. Uh, what a splendid gift to the city of Exeter to put on a series of lectures like the one that is being put on. So I'm sure we, uh, we, all, we all wish the series well. We also made the point earlier on that the screen isn't quite straight, and I said, well, probably quite a few people in the audience aren't quite straight either. <laughs> In my, in my book, The Savage Text, I compare the church's use of the Bible and the proscription of lesbian and gay people with its use in earlier periods of church history in persecuting Jews and witches, in subjugating women, in justifying slavery, and in inventing and fostering white racism. In each of these cases, proof texts from the Bible were pressed into a cruel and a savage use. According to Anglican bishops, Anglicans have two views of the Bible. This was big news to me, but this is what the bishops say. The guidebook view and the witness view. And I account for this history of misinterpretation by the claim that Jesus Christ, the eternal word, God made flesh, gets fatally confused with the Bible, also called the word of God. The person is conflated with the proposition and the spirit with the letter. The point of both testaments is rather to witness to God's revelation in Christ. As Richard Hooker says, the general end both of old and new is one. The difference between them consisting in this, that the old did make wise by teaching salvation through Christ that should come, the new by teaching that Christ the Saviour is come. The witness view witnesses to this revelation. On the guidebook view, the Bible is the revelation, a veritable Koran or new Torah. And on this hypothesis, the rancor in the Anglican Communion is simply explained. When the guidebook view of the Bible prevails, literal understandings of text get to authorise cruelty and misery. And that is what is being replayed before our eyes and ears in the case of homosexuality. In Romans 1, Paul accuses Gentiles of the sin of idolatry. But the idolatry of the book, or bibliolatry, not the alleged idolatry of homosexual practice, is the root cause of our current problems. Well, you might be relieved to know that I'm not going to repeat that thesis because I want, although I, I stand by it, but I want to share some new arguments which can be found in much more detail in God, Sex and Gender, which um, Amazon tells me, because the publishers haven't told me yet, it will be available on the 6th of April. That work draws on recent scholarship in classics and in medical history, but also in Christian doctrine, to show that there are no reasons why lesbian and gay couples should not have their unions blessed in churches, or that they should be regarded as second-class citizens or bishops. I should add, I have a website and this, the full text of the lecture will be on the website tomorrow. So do please go to that if you're interested. 
Adrian Thatcher will find me, and the name of the website is just adriansatcher.org. So then section one is um, sex in the time of Jesus. When I ask students how many sexes there are, they look at me with blank incomprehension. But the question or the assumption that humanity is divided into two sexes is a modern one. And it's a troublesome one that should not be read back into the Bible or tradition. For most of Christian history, people believed that there was a single sex. And that sex was called man or men. And this one sex, men, it existed on a continuum between greater, which was male, and lesser, which was female, degrees of perfection. Now this is widely understood in medical history and that book by Thomas Lecoeur, Making Sex, Body and Gender from the Greeks to Freud, lays out this in great detail. Actually, Christians are more familiar with this than they realize. An instructive way into the one sex theory can be found in the easy, unexamined sexism of thousands of Christian hymns, still not finally shredded, which provide primary lingering evidence of this single sex, man. Through the rise of the women's movement and successive waves of feminism, the second or weaker sex has successfully challenged the first or stronger sex in its claim to be first and stronger, but it has not until recently sought to challenge the basic premise that there are two and only two human sexes. The campaigning issue has not been the number of sexes, but whether the two sexes received equal treatment equal rights and equal respect. Now there are many adults in the world who are unable to identify with either label. There are intersex people. There are transsexual and transgendered people. People who cannot easily say they identify with this binary or twofold division of humanity into two biological sexes. And this assumption that there are two sexes and that God made each for the other not only marginalizes lesbian and gay people, but it also marginalizes intersex people, transgender people, and so on because it says there is a certain view of the image of God which is normative and if you're not normal then there's a real problem with you. Uh, either you're evidence of some cosmic fall or uh, God made a mistake in making you as God did. And a recent example of this would be Casta Semenya who won the women's 800 meters race at the World Athletics Championships in Berlin in 2009, only to be told she wasn't a real woman after all. Well, how did babies get made in this single sex? To start with, the second century Greek doctor Galen taught that men and women have the same set of genitals. Okay, you might find that very hard to um, um, get at. This belief was already old in Galen's time, but it continued in the West until about 1750. The principal sexual difference between women and men was that women held their genitals within their bodies and men displayed them outside. A woman had a penis, but it was turned inwards. A woman had testicles. That's why she was always wanting sex. We now know her testicles are ovaries. And the womb, well, what was that? That was really a scrotum tucked away. 
So men and women have the same equipment in this one sex. And as we'll see in a minute, when conception happens, they both make sperm. Aristotle took another view. The one found in Aristotle is that the male provided the form of the newly conceived child, while the mother provided the matter. And the Latin for mother, mater, derives from the one who provides the materia for the child to grow in the womb. Aristotle had little idea what sperma was. He thought the male body was able to concoct food to its highest life-engendering stage into true sperma. There was no fertilization, of course, since there was no egg to fertilize. Sperm conveyed the sensitive soul of life. And, a crucial thing, the hotter the ejaculate, the more likely was the resulting child to be a male one. The matter the female provided was her catamenia, or her menstrual blood. Since the process of menstruation was not understood for more than two millennia, discharged blood was thought to be a leftover of nutrition. Pregnant women did not menstruate because their blood was nourishing the child in the womb. These then are the facts of life as they might have been taught in the time of Jesus. Aristotle's theory of conception was lost to most of the first millennium of Christendom and it was reintroduced in the 13th century through translations of Arabic editions of Aristotle's works. Thomas Aquinas knew these works and was influenced by them. And through him, Roman Catholic thought has also been influenced by, by Aristotle. However, this is the crucial point. The medical professions of Europe until the end of the 17th century largely held to the teachings of Galen. And early medical textbooks in English, which have diagrams of male and female genitals, use the same language. Because even then, uh, the medical profession thought that they were dealing with different sets of the same organs. So Galen thought that a child was concocted from the sperm of men and women. Just as a man ejaculates when he has an orgasm, so does a woman. And remember, each of us has the same equipment. Male and female then provide two versions of the same substance. Their efforts concur, their sperms coagulate, and these are what the female retains and nourishes in her body. Women having orgasms, then, is pretty essential to conception. They must ejaculate. When it became known in the 19th century that ovulation was a silent natural process, and it wasn't discovered then until the 19th century, it became obvious that women's orgasms were not, as had been thought for thousands of years, necessary for conception to happen. And you can imagine what the Victorians made of that. If they're not necessary, well, women shouldn't have them. I move on then, fairly rapidly, to the New Testament. Now, the New Testament assumes Galen's theory about men and women both producing sperm. And evidence of this is in Hebrews 11.11. 11. The King James Version has, through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Whereas the NIV is just all over the place with this. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, 
was enabled to become a father. Now, my colleague John Morgan suggested to me that strength to produce seed may mean no more than become able to bear a child. But one authority, William Loder, says when Hebrews speaks of Sarah's receiving the capacity to produce seed, it reflects the view of conception according to which both men and women produce semen, which then merges to form the fetus. But there's another reason why I think the King James Version is right. It's the 400th anniversary of the, K of the KJV this year. 400 years ago, when the translators were puzzling over this text, everybody, I suspect, in England knew that babies were produced by men producing seed and women producing seed and the seeds coagulating. So this would have been not a problem to them because they thought that is how babies were made. Imagine the translators of the NIV towards the end of the 20th century. They've got no idea about the way that ancient conception was thought to work. And so what do they do? They make a complete mess of it. So the second part of my talk is about gender in the time of Jesus. The distinctions between men and women were based not on sex because they have the same organs. The distinctions between men and women were based on gender. And men, it was infallibly believed, were assumed to have greater heat. I mean, that sounds completely daft. And Thomas Lecour says it is completely daft, but it was something that was very widely believed. Another key masculine quality was hardness, juritia. This was not wholly a phallic characteristic. It referred to the muscularity of the ideal male body. And it also symbolized the moral uprightness and self-discipline that men were presumed to embody. The opposite quality assigned to women was softness or delicateness, militia. And militia represents not only delicate bodies, but apparently their love of luxury, the languor of their minds, the ease with which they gave themselves to their emotions and their dissolute morals. So an illicit move was made effortlessly from certain assumed biological facts about men to certain moral conclusions, this time about the active and passive sexual roles of men and women. The hardness of men marked not only their moral austerity, but also their role as sexual penetrators and aggressors. In a complementary way, the softness of women denoted their role as sexually penetrated. And beyond that, the passive role they are expected to play, not only in sexual relations, but in society generally. These are quotations from, from recent scholarship in, in classics. If you want the references, you can find them um, on my website, because I, I have been, I hope, fairly meticulous in providing them. The term spectrum, I think, expresses well the elevation of men over women. One Harvard scholar, Diana Swankert, a strong advocate of the one-sex theory, she's a classicist, explains ancients did not conceive of the people assigned to the ends of the spectrum as referring to two genetically differentiated sexes, male and female. Rather, ancients constructed the human physique on a one-body, multi-gendered model with the perfect body deemed male or man. Greek and Roman men, I'll come to Jewish men in a moment, were thought to embody physical and political strength, rationality, spirituality, superiority, activity, dryness, 
and penetration. Women were thought to embody the negative qualities of physical and political weakness, irrationality, fleshliness, inferiority, passivity, wetness, and being penetrated. Diana Swankart stresses that these opposite qualities do not at all reflect two opposite sexes. Rather, she says, because all bodies were thought to contain more, that is masculine, and less, that is feminine, perfect elements, that required constant maintenance to produce the perfect male masculine body. Females and other gendered beings like androgynes and feminine people were deemed differently imperfect versions of the male body. Versions whose imperfections like breasts and fat and menstruation and weak sperm and inverted internal penises, these were manifestations of their impaired physiological health. But just to finish off a quotation from Diana Swankert, men, she says, were defined as hard, rational penetrators at the top of the social ladder, while women occupied its lowest rungs because they were soft, leaky, and wild. The least perfect male bodies, their vaginas deemed undescended penises. Men were ranked higher than women, and women, as Colleen Conway explains, belong with slaves and animals in the requirement of submission to male authority. Slaves, too, were like animals, women, and foreigners insofar as they lived lives of submission. In short, understanding what it meant to be a man in the Greco-Roman world meant understanding one's place in a rationally ordered cosmos in which free men were placed at the top and what fell beneath could all be classified as unmen. True men, she continues, were set high above all others. Whether these others were slaves, women, boys, foreigners, or men who assumed a passive role in sexual relations. With regard to sexual activity, men were definitely on top. Acting like a man required one to assume the active role in private sexual practice as well as public life. To be passive means to submit to this domination. And Aristotle is cited for the assumption that men are more godlike than women because being active, their activity was linked to the creative activity of the gods. And because God is supremely perfect, then men are more like God than women are. It's a good job that I'm only describing this and not proclaiming it. <laughs> so then, section three, rereading biblical texts in the light of this analysis of sex and gender. These long forgotten beliefs about sex and gender are a necessary precondition for understanding key texts in the Bible which appear to confirm very conservative views about homosexuality and about the inferior status of women. So the first one I come to is 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 15 to 16. Shall I take the members of the body of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with the prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. It's not often understood that according to Paul, when members of Christ's body have sex with their partners, the very spirit of Christ is exchanged between them. This is straightforwardly to be noted in Pauline thought, and Paul's arguments are clear enough. The bodies of Christians are part of the body of Christ. When the bodies of Christians are sexually joined with other bodies, the body of Christ is joined with them as well. 
And that's why he thinks the Christian men who have sex with prostitutes are behaving outrageously. But once we think ourselves into the ancient physiology accompanying the argument, it becomes clearer still just what Paul means. Ancient doctors thought that pneuma, or spirit, collected most potently in the seed, or sperm, which means that spirit could be ejaculated in intercourse. Some ancients thought men and women could both ejaculate, and since Christ's spirit dwelt within believers' bodies, when believers had sex, they sent Christ's spirit out with their sperm. Now, that might sound disgusting to us, but in the first century, that wouldn't have been found disgusting at all. And it's precisely why St. Paul says what he does about Corinthian men having sex with sex workers. When married Christians have sex for St. Paul, that's fine. It's fine, and they share Christ's spirit with each other. Paul was unperturbed, too, by marital sex in a mixed marriage between a believer and an unbeliever. But a Christian man who has sex with a woman to whom he's not married and who is not part of the body of Christ sends Christ's spirit, or is in danger of doing so, into an unworthy and unholy receptacle. She's not a Christian. She's not part, then, of the body of Christ. But if he's married to someone who isn't a Christian, you know what St. Paul's answer is. The unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. The marriage sanctifies their relationship and the sexual exchanges within it. Now on to Romans 1. I want to start by latching on to a single key point, how Paul interprets unnatural relations. There's good reason to doubt that Paul had lesbian sex in mind at all in Romans 1.26. This is the only reference in the Bible to women having sex with women. And what I'm about to say is I doubt whether it is even about that. First of all, the reference to their women draws attention to the men in the background. These women would be subject to men, as all women were, and passive in relation to them. Unnatural might just mean non-coital. Or taking the lead, or appearing too keen, or receiving oral or anal sex, or having sex sitting on top of their male partners, might all have counted as unnatural. Unnatural sex, in the case of women, thinks Gareth Moore, involves acts such as oral and anal intercourse with men, or anything which causes them to forsake their natural instrument. In fact, just the reverse position with a woman on top of a, of a, of a man will be regarded as shocking, because that reverses the order whereby men are always on top and women underneath. Now, actually, Clement of Alexandria and Augustine, they, even they, thought that Romans 1.26 was not about lesbian sex. It was simply about unnatural sex. And unnatural sex was anything that deviated from the narrow procreative norm, where the man was the active partner and the woman the passive one. So I doubt very much whether the women who were having unnatural sex were lesbians at all. I mean, it makes no difference if they were, really. But I don't think we can even say that. Um, their eagerness was outrageous because it violated ancient gender codes. Okay, so another part of Romans 1. 
God in ancient thought is overwhelmingly male. So to be masculine is to be more like God than to be feminine. Now then, if a man consents to be penetrated, he forsakes an important part of the God-likeness in him. He willfully allows his own body to be treated as if it were the body of a woman. The mysterious link between passive male sex and idolatry in Romans 1 now becomes explicable. Paul's claim that the Gentiles exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man now begins to make good sense. The glory, or doxa, of God means the appearance of God, as it does in 1 Corinthians 15. There is a bodily appearance, or doxa, of God among men. This is not exchanged, as the NIV translates, rather it is changed, as elaxan um, very plausibly and conveniently translates. The danger is that God's appearance in masculinity is changed by this very unmasculine behaviour of men who were passive in sex with other men. And this behaviour damages the appearance of God's divinity among men because men choose to feminise themselves when they take part in this behaviour. So once again, I think the understanding of gender in the first century provides the key to unlocking Paul's reasons for disgust at at least some same-sex relations. Having natural sex in the ancient world involves a man penetrating a woman. If a man is penetrated, he compromises his masculinity. It is, St Paul thought, unnatural for a man to want or to consent to this. If they have non-penetrative sex, then the masculinity of both of them is compromised because neither of them, then, is a penetrator. Now, according to some commentators, Dale Martin being one of them, Paul thought all sexual desire was sinful. And of course that's why he discouraged marriage, one of the reasons why he discouraged it. But Paul thought that same-sex desire was excessively sinful. He thought it sinful not because it was homosexual, but because it involved the forsaking of gender roles which he considered natural. He thought that it involved the serious sin of idolatry because he thought that if a man forsook his God-given masculinity, he forsook part of his favoured likeness to God. It represented a turning away from God into depravity. And the next example is 1 Corinthians 11, 7 to 15. And that is about men not covering their head because they are the image and glory of God in church. Women, however, are the glory of man, says St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 7. And the passage concludes, Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things, again, again and again, the appeal to nature, the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. Now, the argument in 1 Corinthians is about whether women should pray with their heads uncovered. And once again, Paul, Paul's fury is best understood as directed against gender infraction. 
the very nature of things, he says, teaches that a man's long hair is a disgrace, while a woman's long hair is her glory. But the theology behind the so-called very nature of things is also stuck in the first century. The image of God is not distributed equally among men and women, as modern readings of Genesis 1.27 take for granted. The image of God is the male. So I quote again from 1 Corinthians 11. A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So on that theology, the rabbinic theology of the time, I guess, the image of God is supremely in the male. He is the glory or the appearance of the divine. Insofar as women are in the image of God, it is derived from the man who is more perfect. And that's fairly securely Paul's meaning and Augustine's meaning following him. The man is superior not just because he's more like God, he was made first, he gives birth to the woman, and the woman is made for him not he for the woman. Dismal stuff. So far I've relied on recently excavated knowledge of ancient gender codes in the Greek and Roman empires. And two Jewish scholars, Saul Oliot and Daniel Boyerin, have shown that similar codes operated within Judaism. Men having anal sex with men is a capital offence in the Levitical Code. But now we know why, or think we know why, this is. It's not because there was something Anglicans call homosexual practice going on that God doesn't like. It is that if you are penetrated, you are feminized, you abandon your masculinity. Since it is so much better and more perfect to be a man than to be a woman, you are crazy to compromise your masculinity. Cross-dressing is also forbidden in the Torah. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. And in the Baptist church where I came to faith, this was literally believed. If a woman turned up in jeans, she'd be sent away. Now then, why in Deuteronomy 22.5? is a matter that God detests so much. It's a forbidden mixing of kinds. Nine times is the idea of a kind found in Genesis 1. It's rooted in creation's ordering. And cross-dressing mixes kinds. No self-respecting man, so the priests thought, would ever appear in public as a woman. And Byron finds a strong parallelism in parallelism in the Hebrew of this verse and in Leviticus 18.22. That is, the wrongness of men having anal sex in men has nothing at all to do with a particular type of sin, homosexual sin. It has everything to do with the mixing of kinds that the Torah forbids. And my next example is Galatians 3.28. Well, that's a favourite text of mine. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, if the Conservatives can't have their preferred readings of Romans 1, the Liberals can't have their preferred readings of Galatians 3.28. Since there were not two sexes in the mind of Paul, the idea that he was advocating equality between them is a non-starter. And the history of the reception of this text shows that it's not until, what, the 1960s or early 70s 
that this text was given preference over other texts in the Pauline corpus which pretty much say that women are to be in submission to men. So I don't think one can easily kind of leap into this and say, oh, the Bible teaches that the two sexes are equal, when it doesn't even teach there are two sexes. So Paul is probably citing Genesis 1, 27, which unfortunately has a different reception, which, yes, has a different reception history in the East than the West. I follow Susanna, my colleague Susanna Cornwall's focusing on male and female. It's male and female in contrast to Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. What she says there is, uh, I mean there are arguments for this, it's not just assertion. What is ended in Christ is that single continuum of which I spoke earlier, which runs male and female. As she says, the assertion that there is no male and female in Christ does not necessarily mean that there is no male or female. Biological reproduction in its present form is therefore still possible. However, what no longer exists in Christ is the all-encompassing cipher male and female for humanity. The end of male and female is the end of an exclusive heteronormative system wherein humans are completed as humans only by so-called sexual complementarity. So what is ended in Christ is, price, is precisely that continuum where human beings are given merit on the basis of where they stand in relation to the perfect male. That very thing is swept away by everybody counting, by everybody mattering, by everybody male or female or third sex or intersex or whatever sex having their part and their place in the body of Christ. And in the last 40 years a new doctrine, the complementarity of the sexes has been smuggled into Catholic and Anglican theology and that has been allowed to proscribe same-sex couples even further. But complementarity is a modern dogma, nothing more, and it's difficult to reconcile with any readings of Galatians 3.28. Many of these ancient views are to us bizarre. It's also bizarre that large sections of the contemporary church still adhere to them. How is Christ honoured in all this? People once had ancient views about the physical world that may bring a smile to us. Jerusalem was the centre of the earth. The earth was the centre of the universe. The sun revolved around it. Ancient views about gender are just as implausible, even as they were once unquestioned. Can anything be salvaged from the two sperm theory? It's nearer to modern genetics, actually, than its rival male sperm only theory, which treats mothers as passive receptacles of men's sperm. The supposed commonality of sex organs may even have suggested a commonality in our shared humanity within the single sex man. With one sex, there was no battle of the sexes. But there was no equality either, and that was just as bad. So in the end, I don't buy the one sex theory. I'm just trying to understand it and to see whether there might be or have been merit in it. There was a nest of assumptions about men being naturally more active, naturally more creative, naturally more perfect. And these assumptions gave rise then, as they do now, to contempt for females who are lower, and this contempt sometimes bursts into outright misogyny. 
There's an amazing arrogance then about masculinist assumptions of superiority over women. Worse that these assumptions were understood as natural. Once you grant these premises, grant that men are more perfect and more like God than women, then of course God can't become incarnate as a woman. Of course the twelve were all male. Of course Christ can't be represented by a woman. She's inferior. Christ can only be represented by the best. Of course she can't be a priest. But once those ancient premises collapse, so do the centuries of argumentation based upon them. They are exposed for what they are. And these then are the new arguments for a gay-friendly and woman-friendly church. I group them together into two sort of related sections. The argument from the classical context. It's a good rule of interpretation that key texts need to be understood as far as possible and first, according to their original meanings and contexts so far as we can discern them. That, of course, is not new. What is new is our greater understanding of the ancient contexts, which in turn produces meanings very different from those assigned to them by a surface reading in English nearly 2,000 years later and replicated in modern arguments in the churches about homosexuality. Huge advances in classics help theologians to understand their sources differently. And the second type of argument that I want to uh, make is this argument from gender infraction. There are condemnations in both testaments of men having sex with men, and probably nothing in either testament about women having sex with each other, whatever that might be. The Bible, I think, does condemn men having sex with men. But now we think we know better why that is. It is a matter of gender infraction. It all makes sense if it is assumed that it is better and more perfect and more creative to be a man than to be a woman. Even to act like a woman is for a man to undermine the status of God-given manliness. And that's why men having sex with men is perverse because it is based on these gender norms. Thank God we no longer operate on the basis of these gender norms anymore. Indeed, it is illegal to do so. Although the churches are often sad exceptions to some of the legislation. Now the term homosexuality as a condition of the human person was invented late as 1872. Students gasp when I tell them this. That's when the discourse of homosexuality began. Of course, there was same-sex sex going on before 1872. It would be absurd to deny that. But once this discourse becomes current, it became very useful it became recognised that a minority of persons are attracted to persons of the same sex in this now two-sex world. And this became known as an orientation. And the term orientation, which is also recent in a sexual context, is now well understood. We probably think it's been there for centuries. But there was no understanding of orientation in the ancient world. And it was understood that men desired men and women desired women. The story of David and Jonathan assumes that. But the wrongness of these desires can be explained. It can be explained by gender infraction. And once those gender norms fall, then so does that argument on which wrongness is based. The gender explanation for the wrongness of same-sex sex 
became overlaid by another, which you won't find in the New Testament. Sex is for reproduction only. Where is that in the Bible? And only those sex acts which are reproductive are licit. But this is a second century development. This restriction has now been forgotten, and so should the earlier one. Well, in the version of my talk that will be on the website, there is um, a final section, but I've talked for an hour and I'm not going to go on to it, and I didn't intend to. But that section is called a framework for a sexual theology. And in many senses, it is very traditional. It's pro-marriage. It's pro-understanding committed relationships as covenants. It makes much of the virtues of chastity and so on. But above all, it is an attempt at an inclusive framework where people who do not conform to heterosexual norms are equally welcomed and valued and their experience of loving and being loved is welcomed as part of their way of being themselves before God. So what I've tried to do then is to anchor modern arguments in ancient discussions and to say that you need to know more about the ancient discussions in order to understand the modern arguments. And when you do, you'll understand those arguments differently. And that makes the task of forming an inclusive church a very biblical task one that actually stands in the tradition of faith, but develops it in a way which honours to God. Or so I claim. Thank you for listening so intently. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. I really enjoyed it. Can you explain there was a difference between the Hebrew idea of sexuality in the time, or Paul's, what he brought, compared to the Greek culture he was writing in? I wasn't clear on that. Thank you. Yeah, it's very important to see that there are clearly differences between Greco-Roman culture and Jewish culture. And I don't regard myself as sufficiently a good classicist to outline the similarities and the differences. What I am fairly convinced about is that the reason why the Levitical Code says that men who lie with men as with women should be put to death is because one of them is involved in being passive and, and therefore is feminized. I think that there is a commonality in the, in the reasons for finding sex between men wrong. But there are many differences, of course, between sexuality in Greek and Roman culture, and certainly differences with regard to men having sex with men, and of course men also having sex of a kind with boys as well. You'll be clear, nothing of what I've said comes anywhere near advocating that. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't answer your question in more detail. It's a super question. Um, you described in great detail the patriarchal culture from which a lot of this grew I wonder in your move towards creating a more gay-friendly church, you think the language that we use to address and describe God, him, herself plays a part. And I don't know if you're familiar with Brian Wren's book, What Language Do We Borrow? Which yes. obviously the fact that the language we address God on is drawn from that patriarchal culture. <laughs> well, I, yes, thank you. I mean, I don't myself, when I'm preaching, ever use the male pronoun of God. For, so I don't talk about God as he. It's taken me 15 years, and even then I occasionally lapse into it. But I do think the, the male God is, is a, at the root of the patriarchal system, and that needs to be addressed. Now, I do think that there, that there are actually arguments within the mainstream of theology that do this. 
I mean, an example of this, the, the students here tonight who know more about this than I do, I mean, take the Gregories in the Eastern Church in the fourth century. They say it is just as right to call God mother as it is to call God father. And do you know why they say that? They say because if you are male or female, then you are sexed, but God is beyond sex. It's, it's creatures that are sexed. The creator isn't sexed. The, creation is a, the creator is above those distinctions. The creator is the author of them. So in that sense, the idea that, that God is, is male is idolatry. It is absolutely idolatry to take the metaphor of father and make it into a literal matter. God transcends all names. No, God is the I am. God is the name that is above every name. And to say that God is a male God is to, is to bring that God down to something else. It's to misuse language, I would say. So that's why I do still, I mean, I began to think about this in 1980. And, and 30 years on, I still think that sexism is a huge problem in liturgy and in, and in devotional language and in theological language. And I try and root it out wherever I can find it. Could you clarify a point for me, please? It sounds to me as if you're interpreting these Bible passages quite traditionally and then saying because they were written due to a mistake that we should just ignore them? No, I don't think they were, they were written due to a mistake. But you said the mistaken idea of, of, of human sex. That well, I don't, think, I don't think they are mistaken. Um, what I'm trying to do is to set the passages in the context in which they are found. What I'm trying to do is to understand them. I do, and I don't regard myself as being able to take liberties with scripture either. I mean, I take scripture absolutely profoundly seriously. And that's why I want to pursue what possibilities of meaning these texts actually have. So I'm not saying that, um, I'm not saying that they're mistaken. But then, I mean, clearly they are mistaken if we think that babies are made in the way that either Aristotle or Galen or anyone else living around that time thought. We just have different explanations, as we do about the nature of the material world, that's all. Now, to be people of faith in our worldview means to be both the same and to be different from being people of faith in that worldview. And that's our problem, which I'm trying to sort out and equip the people of God to live with. There is an argument which has been going on for a long time. I wonder if you'd like to express an opinion on it. <laughs> um, it has been said that what we commonly call the homosexual disposition, that is of the, the male or female radically unwilling to engage sexually with the, with the other sex, did not exist in the ancient world, whether Hebrew or classical. Uh, this was the point of view which was taken by the Gloucester report produced by the Church of England, I suppose, getting on for 20 years ago now. 81, 30 years. 30, oh, well, I'm getting on, I tell you. The, <laughs> the years are beginning to telescope, I'm afraid. <laughs> It was controversial even when they expressed it because the Bishop of the then Bishop of London in his foreword contradicted what the uh, report had itself said, which gave, a, to, to say the least, a rather sort of, you know, divided view. Um, I wonder if you'd like to express any sort of view as to whether the homosexual condition is as you might say, a modern thing within the last few hundred years. Well, first of all, I'm intrigued to know how you got hold of the Gloucester report because I thought that all copies of it were actually, I mean, it was never published, was it? It was suppressed. And I tried very hard to get, oh, you've got a copy of the Gloucester report. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be knocking on your door because I've not been able to find one Okay, that might be worth quite a lot of money. <laughs> we have to be clear about terminology. And 
you're asking me to express an opinion on what you've just said. And uh, the opinion is this, that only in the 19th century did both Christians and secular people talk about sexuality. That's a modern word, it's a 19th century word. So sexuality, bisexuality, homosexuality, heterosexuality, all of this is a 19th century language. When you impose a 19th century language upon texts which are 2,000 years or more older, then there is bound to be a mismatch. So what is true is that nobody started talking about men having sex with men by means of the term homosexuality until the second half of the 19th century. That, I think, is well established. However, there were other ways of talking about it. And a common way of talking about it was to, to use the word sodomy. So that would have been a kind of earlier vocabulary. So, clearly, there is same-sex desire going on long before 1872, but the authors of the Gloucester Report and Graham Leonard, if indeed he says, as you say he says, um, they are on to something because it's commonly said that our language for discussing sex is actually a modern language that you, you don't actually find in earlier periods and certainly not in the Bible. Before we go over to get food and drinks, we give a final round of applause to Adrian Thatcher. Thank you very oh, much. God bless you. Thank you.